it comes to classic FPS, it reminds me of the forefathers of classic FPS, Doom, Duke Nukem, Wolfenstein 3D, and Shadow Warrior. With the action-packed levels, bugloads of weaponry to take out your enemy, and the feel of the awesome retro vibe of pixel art. And over the years, we see the FPS genre have gone up and changed with awesome 3D graphics by using Unreal Engine and updated gameplay with Doom 2016, Wolfenstein The New Order and the Shadow Warrior series and the less we talk about Duke Nukem Forever the better. But also over the years we've seen inspiration classic FPS that have been made with Project Warlock a successor of being a Wolfenstein clone now becoming a well-known classic FPS game with Project Warlock 2 being out already for early access. Iron Fury a direct clone inspiration of the classic Duke Nukem with the awesome futuristic theme and quasi weaponry. But what about the other three FPS that have been released? Arcos, Nightmare Reaper, and Vormatorandum, with those three being released in 2021 to 2022. Well then, it's time to look at these three classic FPS in the three part of review where I look into the three classic FPS and to see if it's worth the money to get them and to put them into your collection. Up to bat, the beautiful yet disturbing Vormatorium. So grab yourself some popcorn and your carbonated drinks and enjoy the carnage. Being published and developed by Scumhead, and him using the Doom engine like GZ Doom and GZ Builder, comes to be his fifth installment to his classic FPS series. With Lycathorn series, a Metrovania FPS where you can play as Rain and her group of fighters traversing throughout Moravania, perishing mystical creatures that will upset the balance, to the Shrine series playing as the red guy traversing throughout the caves, forests, snowy mountains, and inside someone's stomach? Right. Taking on weird creatures, orcs, and cults with his trusty bone saw, super shotgun, and machine gun comes Vormatorium, a beautiful yet disturbing FPS being kickstarted in January and reaching its goal in February 2021, with the help with Mango, Batandi, I'm 4 and Primeval putting the music, game mechanics and graphics together and hitting its initial release on the 30th of July 2021. An inspired game from the paintings painted by, oh sorry if I pronounced this name wrong, Zitzlaw Bitikinski giving Vormatorium the horror and atmospheric vibe towards the game giving the players and myself a sense of fear when traversing to different parts of the infested well from the broken cities, snow mountains, secluded forests and caves, and mechanical fortress taking on infected creatures, human soldiers from the night orders and the concubine warriors. A great doom clone done by Scumhead and his freelancers teams, but let's dive in and understand what made this game so different from his previous four doom clones. Now like as always, maps of spoiler are coming ahead. If you all want to play this game fresh and want to understand how the gameplay works, then I suggest you skip to this timeline here. I'll give you 5 seconds. Right, can't say I didn't warn ya. With it taking place years ago, in this world comes the forebringer name Vormatorium. 
Vomitorium cursed the whole world of a great plague, seeping through its teeth, causing an infection that turned men into monsters. With the horn of Vomitorium screamed by the uh, scream for seven days, causing the world to fall into a sickly fog. To one of the great warriors named Oh boy, how the fuck do I pronounce his name? Uh Uma the Maiden? Uma the Maiden? Uh, right. Uma the Maiden, fuck! Gathered his man and raged against the infected. With the help of the masons that used the spells of life and purged the land with the demon, uh... Concubine. Yes, I know, it says that, but I refuse to say it, thank you. Anyway, with the demon concubines and the concubath devoured the infection, with Undermandin using the Sword of Life, Sephirim, took it to battle against Vormatorium, and within one fatal strike, Vormatorium returned to the skies and the infection seemingly disappeared. But after one year has passed, and the infection has returned with the three factions split and unable to stop the infection for the second time, with Udamayadin and his soldiers returning back to their stone fortress, and the concubath and her sisters have fled to their airship and this is where you come in. The masons had different plans entirely going by the name of Project Nefelheim. is a project to create a monster capable of defeating Vormatorium once and for all. With countless sacrifice and failures comes the actual success of the true Nefelheim, the ultimate cure and warrior of the Masons. As the Nuffelheim, you travel to different areas of the infected world, the unearthing caverns, the secluded and untouched forest, going up against the infected and warriors from Udamaiden, to the broken cities and deadly caverns fighting against the dragons and concubine sisters, to the unnerving snowy mountains and the birthplace of you and Project Nuffelheim. Understanding the true intentions from the Masons and why they made you. And this is where the story gets very dark and I recommend if you don't like this, skip on ahead. We understand why Vormatorium has returned. The cardinal sin that Uma Maiden has done to Eve. With her plea of help, Vormatorium gave her partial of its power to let Eve twist and consort the warriors into infected however and whenever she pleased. With defeating the consorted Eve and recovering the airship key, we infiltrated the concubath airship, destroying all the concubines and the head of the concubath to retrieve the flask of Eve and all is left is the Sephirmheim, the Sword of Life. And the only way to get that sword is to defeat Uma Maiden and his remaining warriors. During a gruesome battle between you and him, he finally yields and submits the sins he has done to Eve, begging you to take his life to give the Sephirim a new bearer to wield the sword. All that is left is Formatorium, waiting in another world entirely from the infected world. With it being pleased of Unamaiden's departure, by your hand, it wants to give you one final battle to see if you are worthy to protect Eve and let Vomitorium to rest. With one long enduring battle, Vomitorium is pleased with the result, leaving the protection of the new world and Eve to your hands. With the power of Sephirim fusing to the Flask of Eve, Eve is reborn as an angel and able to rid the infection of the world, turning the world back to normal. The gameplay is your average boomer shooter. I use the correct term! Oh, uh, sorry, a classical FPS, but with a metrovania twist, with the game being one big map, and I do mean BIG! Well, with some rooms separate, but also being a metrovania genre as well, it gives the player little to no helping hand when you start the game, with no upgrades and your starter weapon being a pistol. 
With the path being open for the players to traverse at the start and to look around, but the players will soon realise there's only one path to start off. With it being a progression game, players will be able to pick up weapons with the main three being the pistol, the gauntlet and the shotgun to take out enemies during your journey, but we will, uh, but we will talk about the gun game soon. To looking for upgrades that can help the players either last long with health bars and first aid that will help the players survive their journey of the infested world and boss encounters to main requirements like the dash boots and the double jump and the transformation allowing you to reach areas that you couldn't reach before to look for those health upgrades or to progress to the main plot with later on getting a water suit allowing you to submerge into the clear water that you couldn't before and a light creature to help you traverse the dark areas and the less we talk about that thing the better since that thing doesn't know from its ups and downs but with it also being an FPS game, the gun game is also the main feature. With the weapons stated as before, being the other weapons you need in this infested world, starting off with the pistol and right at the beginning getting the gauntlet, and later the shotgun. With powerful upgrades that can cause some massive damage, with the pump shotgun turning into the almighty super shotgun able to plow through all enemies and bosses that will stand in your way. Also with its flash shot, which able to home towards enemies, this gun's become a very, very useful weapon. Then you got your assault rifle. An upgrade to your pistol can be a very useful at some occasions then chip damage in faster rate towards enemies, but won't be very useful towards bosses since they absorb those fireballs like a sponge. Yeah. Not kidding. But with the Cryon upgrade allowing you to freeze enemies completely and give a good old falcon punch to your enemies or hammer them to break them into pieces. Speaking of which, the hammer being the last upgrade and replacement for the gauntlet which are used to break through blocks and melee weapon which can be useful to bash some skulls in but downfall is the enemies are more quick with their fire rate so you're more likely will die and spawn from your last save location. But with that aside, the gun game feels more action packed and fast paced like any other classic FPS games we've seen. From your, stra uh, from your strafing and shooting at enemies, though it does become more strategic when you first start off, but you do begin to realize it does become repetitive very quickly, especially with bosses. Though they do become a challenge, but does drone on since they are absolute bullet sponge to your weapons and yes that does include the super shotgun but with most bosses the strafe and shoot is the only thing you can do but with one of the bosses being the concubine sisters does change up your strategy very quickly by quickly changing attention to one of the sisters and taking aim while avoiding the other one and trust me you will die a lot if you're not too careful. As for the save system for this game, the save system differs from the scumhead's previous work of Lycanthorn and the Shrine, and the originals like Doom and Wolfenstein, with it taking inspiration from Castlevania Sympathy of the Night, where Alucard uses his coffin to save the game and progress of the castle. In Vormatorium, the Masons are your safe and save area from different locations of the world, or just before going up against a boss. He'll be there to save your progress but also restore your health a true way of making a metrovania inspiration game now to talk more about the gameplay we need to look at the controls of the game with the controls being nice and responsive but also can be somewhat confusing for some players in the beginning of the game or for those that haven't actually played any of the classical FPS beforehand, with the movement being based on your W, A, S, and D keys and your spacebar to jump and to double jump once required the jump pack. The control key is to activate or deactivate your sprint with your shift key once unlocking the dash boots to dash. With the movement like that and being able to move the camera with the mouse, I managed to traverse a different location with ease and no problem at all. Same with going up against enemies and bosses, well, most of the time. 
Okay, sure. There's some flaws to it. Sometimes the movement can be a bit too fast with the camera and could possibly run off a cliff or get catched by a stray bullet. With your weapons, left click is to primary fire and your right click if you manage to unlock the weapons upgrades is your ult. Whether being the super shotgun and its flare shot or the assault rifle and its cryo upgrade, the best way to use them effectively by taking out your enemies but also to traverse over water with the cryo mod on your assault rifle and with your weapon switch you can use the mouse wheel or the numpad 1, 2, 3 to switch your weapons. To interacting with doors or masons, you have the E key and you got your abilities and items with R being your health pod, allowing Nelfenheim to restore its health pack, a uh, health back to change into a fetal soul, you can use your Q, transforming Nelfenheim into a small ball to explore some more areas you couldn't reach before. But for some reason, your speed grows tremendously fast. And of course, what better way to find where you're at in a classical FPS is none other than the tab key being your map. And the C key is to activate the light creature. But with my main issue with this upgrade, it seriously doesn't know where it's going most of the time. Since this creature is meant to follow the player, but since this light creature has an area of light effect, it really doesn't help me out with this ass end of the level being pitch black and all. Look, I get it. You want the scare factor with the section, but call blimey, it's the uh, same equivalent of walking through the section blindfolded. Though it did give me some scare factor on my first time, but afterward it's just... <clears throat> got carried away. To make a long story short, that upgrade is not really useful. With a simple control screen like that, it makes it easy to get into, able to navigate through different parts of the infested world with ease and using the required upgrades like the dash boots, fatal soul and the health pods, it made it simple for myself but also the players to quickly move or heal Niflheim in those tight spots with the alpha mansion bosses or the countless waves of enemies. Seeing this game being made in GZ Doom Builder, going with pixel arts format for this game, giving that old school vibe like the original Doom games but with a modern twist, but with it taking inspiration of Zizzol Biskinski, gave Vormatorium a horror and atmospheric vibe when traversing to different parts of the infested world from going to the gloomy parts of the caves, cities and the icy mountains to the most vibrant and untouched forests with the lovely colour palette giving that vibe that most of the infection hasn't taken over to the dark and scary, uh, scary mechanical areas like the facility airship and also the abandoned railways of the old world with awesome graffiti there. With that kind of vibes, it does make the player feel alone in the experience taking on various enemies and bosses on the journey. Speaking of which, with a vast variety of enemies from your normal foot soldiers and masons to the concubine and the infected creatures, with the help of Batandi making each enemies or bosses stand out and being more unique with your first encounters with the foot soldiers and their uniforms. From their normal assault soldiers, brute soldiers, flamethrowers and marksman soldiers and Unamei in himself, to the infected and concubines from your dragons, long-legged creatures, to the most questionable creatures, to the concubine sisters, the infected Eve, and the leaders of the concubines. With Vormatorium, given that fear factor or horror atmosphere in this Metrovania first-person shooter. And last but not least, the Mason, your and your friendlies. Having a bit of a brighter palette indicating players a safe place to interact and to save games. But with that kind of design of enemies and friendlies, it makes them stand out for myself and for the players. As for the GUI, it is very simple and very easy to see and understandable to see the game with ease with 
only showing the health, health upgrade and your first aid on the bottom left hand side of the screen. With the weapons, even with their unique design and color palettes, making it stand out from picking it up from the ground in certain levels to using it in both their original and upgrade forms. And with their map going to their Doom format, but also given all their areas you've traveled their own color palette to understand where you've been and if you need to backtrack to look for those secrets you've missed or to continue on your journey. With particle effects like fire bullets coming from the players and enemies weapons makes it easier to see where the bullets are landing or where the bullets are or projectiles are going to. So players can avoid the incoming attack with ease. With added blood particles being splattered on the wall or on ground, giving that effect like any other Doom clones. Though the game don't have any animatic cinematics, they do make good with the storytelling. From the point you start the game with the simple monochrome palette to interacting with the masons and friendlies with the midway point of understanding how Vomitorium have returned, and the last three bosses being the leader of the concubines, Udamaiden and Vomitorium, with their easy text box and fonts, ta uh, talking to you, the player, to the ending of the game with colorful palettes of the world changing back to normal. Now with the soundtrack, though there are many when traveling to different parts of the infected world, which I say it does make up with some of the ambience to give that horror vibe, making the player feel more alone, but to also listen out for enemies, which makes it more simple and easy. But with that aside, when it comes to encountering bosses, Thanks to Primeval and M4 giving such heart racing pieces with some heavy rock beats when going up against the Concubine Sisters to more saddening tones with the infected Eve and the final encounter of Vomitorium. With that mixture of tones of music giving that player a kind of alertness when facing bosses or understanding of the story of what's happening to the infected world or going against some bosses with a story behind them, making them more interesting but also dark with their storytelling. Have them listen to the soundtrack and tell me what you think. Blimey, when listening to these soundtracks, it makes me feel sad and understand the characters, but it makes me feel sad that I had to take them out. And that's what made this game very interesting with the soundtrack. When it comes to myself and the player's first dive into the game, you tend to get lost very quickly with how big and open world it is in Vormitorium. With no guidance of where to go first and hitting roadblocks after roadblocks to explore to different areas, but acquiring the equipment and new weapons, it becomes more easy and able to keep the replayability alive with the backtracking to one of the roadblocks that you couldn't access before, allowing you to allowing you the player to look for secrets you've missed but also to continue on the main journey that you couldn't access before. Well, except the dark ruins of the old world. Yeah, listen, not a mad fan with the light equipment having its own issues of trying to find me and bouncing off the walls, leaving me in the dark. <sighs> Look, if I want to walk in the dark, I might as well walk around the house blindfolded and in the dark, running into objects or enemies. 
If the light upgrade was more of an attachment on the player, giving it a point of light effect, then it would have been it wouldn't been an issue. Though the saving rooms are spread out to different locations, it does make the player look out for the safe rooms to save and restore health and first aid before they encounter a new area or bosses, but it would be nice to indicate where you are when you load it into the game to make it easy. But with the gameplay being a simple strafe and shoot, the gun game does get a little bit repetitive when it comes to taking on common enemies, great and small. Same with some bosses. If the bosses had different attack patterns when reaching the halfway mark, or in some instance, like the concubine sisters, having one of the sisters being more enraged, the boss battle would become more epic, but also being able to make the player to switch it up and learn a new pattern of the bosses. But nevertheless, the gun game is fun, especially the gun upgrades with the shotgun becoming the super shotgun with the solo shot and the pistol to the assault rifle with it cryo upgrade able to shatter your enemies and the gauntlet to the mallet. But with that aside, the graphics, both the GUI and the world environment and enemies with the GUI being simple and easy to see and not taking up the screen, it really shows that less is more. Able to display the health and how much health upgrades the player have collected and same goes with the first aid kit. Though lacking in the crosshair, the bullets does somewhat hit or miss their targets, but with the amount of spread fire the weapons give, I don't think you'll be able to miss your shot. And with their map and their color coded palette for the areas, it becomes easy to look at and to see where you were previously at before, but also to indicate where to travel to or back to continue on your journey. As for the world environment, being a horror uh, atmospheric inspiration, most of the area does stand out very well with the areas having landmarks to make it easy for the players to find their way back as for the color palette. It does give that horror, uh, horror vibe, letting the player know that you are all alone on your journey in this infected world. And, the, and with some untouched areas like the forest it does change the tone a bit that not all the world are infested to the creepy vibe of the mechanical area and the lost world knowing the cost of the infected world. As for the enemies and bosses and their color palette, make them stand out, uh, well most of the time. But with their unique design to give that horror factor, it does hit the nail on the head. From the normal foot soldiers, the concubine enemies, and the infected creatures like the dragons and the oh, grotesque creatures that you have to see for yourself. Though with little explanation of the story, it does paint the picture of how it happened in the beginning and how you, the player, are made and tasked to journey throughout the infected world to fix the infected world and make it anew. So the reason why Vomitory Return again inflicted the world the second time of the infection to the end of how the world returned back to normal with little explanation does show more of the story. And to accomplish all of this game of course is the soundtrack made from M4 and Primeval making different tone and vibes when going up against different bosses it does make you feel like you're in a fight for your life but with the ambience while tra traveling to different area are fitting to its horror atmospheric vibe if you want to listen to the soundtrack you can check them up on YouTube and have a listen to yourself but would recommend playing the game and get that thrive of fighting for your life. But is it worth 15 Australian dollars for it being a Doom clone? Then yes! Yes, I say yes it is. It is worth it to have it in your collection. If you are a mad fan of the forefathers of the classical FPS then this game is for you with it following the footsteps but also being unique in its design. With it being Scumhead's fifth classical FPS, you can tell that him and the help of the freelancers have put in the time and effort to make this game as he envisioned it. Being a horror and atmospheric Metrovania FPS inspired by the artist of Zitzko Bikinski. 
making the game something to buy and to give it a go and see for yourself. Well done Scumhead for making this game with your freelancers making this game of how you envisioned it. Hope to see more of your work in the future and to give it a go. I'll see you Scumhead in the future. Well, that's Vormatorium for you ladies and gentlemen, an interesting classical FPS game with a horror and atmospheric vibe to it, and the first part of the three part review series for the, uh, for the Planetary's throwback. With the next game being up to bat is Arcos. I think it will be a nice change of pace to look at a nice colourful vibe before we jump into the next crazy... vibe? Oh, that can wait. Oh, that can definitely wait. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to leave a like and your experience of Vormatorium in the comments below. But if you are a new time traveller, feel free to subscribe and join the journey of where and when we could be travelling to next time for the Planetary's throwback. But until next time, hope you enjoyed your time travelling journey one game at a time. Until next time, this is your fellow time traveling gamer signing off, and I'll see you guys next time. Ta-ra!